With the trends we're observing and the technologies and practices emerging around us that are already helping shape the future, we can begin to imagine how all of these elements might combine and coalesce into larger stories about who we'll be as people and what higher education will be in the future. Scenario for growth, skyrocketing funding for cybersecurity and privacy. A small cluster of prospective students and their parents ambles across the wooded lawn of a Northwestern university, coming to a stop in front of an angular glass and metal building. Its five-story walls jut above the encircling pines in a mosaic display of shapes and patterns, a modern architectural marvel standing out from an otherwise traditional red brick campus. Some of you were asking earlier about your students' data health and safety, the tour group's tour guide says, motioning proudly at the building. This is the Dorothy E. Denning Center for Data Wellness, which was opened just last year through a very generous $550 million endowment. The guide pauses for dramatic effect as visible amazement ripples across the group. One parent in the back of the group nudges their kid, eyes wide as if to say, wow. With this endowment, the guide continues, our school is poised to be at the forefront of modern data wellness practices and innovations. We have some of the world's best cybercrime professionals and data physicians working here in the center. So your students will not only have access to world-class learning and work placement opportunities, but they'll also be completely data fit while they're under our protective care. The guide takes out their phone and holds it aloft. But don't just take my word for it. If everyone can pull up your data fitness apps, you'll see that we've already been cleaning and strengthening your personal data health even in the short time you've arrived on campus. A prospective student eagerly opens the data fitness app on her phone and is immediately greeted with the ding of a notification. You have 10 resolved data health issues, the notification reads. She navigates to the summary dashboard in her app where the needle on a small meter jumps all the way to the right indicating full data health. You are at maximum data fitness, a header at the top of the dashboard reads. Now, the guide interjects, I don't do this for all my tours, but if you'd like to get a peek inside the center, we can make up the time by skipping a few of the other stops on the tour. The group voices their approval and makes their way down the short path to the large glass entryway to the center's lobby. Because programs have spent the past 10 years fighting for funding, cybersecurity and data privacy budgeting have now become a dividing issue. Some stakeholders see it as a strategic investment, while others see it as a waste of money that should be used for more direct student services, with limited ability to recruit students based on previous offerings such as extra and co-curricular support, institutions are leveraging their strong cybersecurity and privacy stances as selling points. Our community is wondering whether this cybersecurity and privacy first stance is the new normal. Scenario for collapse, the end of the World Wide Web. Message dated July 21st, 2035, 9:10 a.m. Hello, Dr. Silva. It was a pleasure meeting you at the conference in Sao Paulo last week. As we discussed, I'm very interested in your research on three-dimensional string nets and would love to set up a time to chat more about how my recent work on neutrino interactions might help advance the work you're doing. Just let me know if you have some availability for a call next week and I'll send over an invite. Best, Danisha Evans, PhD. Message dated August 12th, 2035. 14.35 p.m. Greetings, Dr. Evans. I apologize for the delay in my response. It appears your message was sent to my spam folder. I'm assuming due to some recent changes in our permissions with international email communications, it may be easier to correspond through our personal email, as global email platforms tend to be easier for those sorts of things. My personal email is redacted. Otherwise, I should have some availability next week. Tuesday at 2 p.m. your time. I look forward to receiving your invite. Dr. Lucas Silva. Message dated August 17th, 2035, 1515 p.m. Hi, Lucas. Your personal email address was redacted from your message, likely due to your new communication restrictions and filters, or possibly due to mine. I've attempted several times to forward you a meeting invite, but I keep receiving delivery failure notifications. I'll just add the Zoom link here, which you can use for our meeting tomorrow. Redacted. Darnisha. Message dated August 18th, 2035, 801 AM. Greetings, Darnisha. 
The Zoom link you provided was redacted as well, likely due to redacted. I wonder if redacted might be more effective for communicating from here on out, in which case you can find me at redacted. Here's hoping we can connect soon. I really do believe there is great potential between our two bodies of research. Lucas. Message dated August 18th, 2035, 9 o'clock a.m. Violation notice. Your recent message to D. E-V-A-N-S at state.edu have been flagged as violations of communication restriction 13.B.1 prohibiting the international exchange of information that is of a sensitive nature and or of national interest. Communications to D-E-V-A-N-S at state.edu have been restricted for the next 90 days after which messages will be subject to additional monitoring and restrictions as needed. Message dated August 18th, 2035, 10.15 a.m. Redacted. The fragmentation of the internet has had widespread impacts on nearly every facet of life. Although international cybercrime has seen a significant reduction, few internet users believe that the benefits outweigh the costs. Altogether, the higher education community is worried that without reinstatement of the World Wide Web, we will never get back to being a global community. Scenario for Constraint, Sacrificing Privacy for Security Here comes the morning rush, Danny mutters as he sets down his coffee and stands to greet the influx of students arriving for the day's classes. He motions to the student nearest to his kiosk. Step on up, Danny says to the student. Set your phone and any wearables you have on the scanner and let me see your computer, please. The student sets a phone, watch, and pair of digital glasses on a small flat surface that flashes green once it registers the device. Danny takes the student laptop and connects it to a small cable running to a monitor on a table behind the kiosk. The monitor flips awake to a screen of the school's mascot, a cartoonish old miner wearing a hard hat and wielding a pickaxe, tapping his foot and staring at a wristwatch. Scanning blinks in and out at the top of the screen. Since your last scan, have any of these devices been in the possession of another person or an extended for an extended period of time? Even a friend or family member, Danny asks. No, the student replies. Since your last scan, have you visited any of our prohibited websites or downloaded any of our prohibited apps, Danny asks. Motioning to a poster on the wall listing the prohibited websites and apps. No, the student replies. Danny's monitor chirps a quick happy tune signaling the completion of its work. Your phone and glasses are clean and can be removed from the scanner, Danny says. Your watch was flagged as hosting a suspicious anomaly. Do you consent to a digital scrub for your watch now free of charge? Failing to consent will prohibit you from being able to enter the campus at this time. Yes, I consent, the student replies. Danny mashes a button on his monitor and the device scanner kicks back on, this time flashing yellow as it removes the watch's impurities. He unplugs the cord from the student's laptop and hands the laptop back to the student. You will be on limited internet access for the next 30 days, as you did indeed visit one of our prohibited sites. You're lucky though, as no anomalies were detected. If you'll stand over there, your watch should be finished scrubbing in just a moment. The student steps aside, annoyed but resigned. Next, Danny yells. Today's data landscape looks very different from how it did 10 years ago. In 2031, the first Worldwide Identity Federation was instituted as a result of several large international identity federations merging. It is responsible for creating, refining, and enforcing international identity verification standards. Not surprisingly, these changes were first met with resistance from students, staff, and faculty alike. However, over the past few years, people have generally grown accustomed to compartmentalizing internet access, keeping work at work, learning at school, and personal access at home. The new normal has been uncomfortable, but we remain committed to building a safe digital world. Scenario for transformation, establishing cybersecurity and privacy training as foundational curricular elements. Everyone come to the rug and sit crisscross applesauce. Mrs. Taylor instructs her kindergarten class. A dozen kids noisily bound over to a rug tucked into a corner of their classroom, each finding a place to sit on one of the small circles dotted across the rug's fabric. Jackson, put the glue down and come sit, she chides. From her stool at the front of the rug, Mrs. Taylor opens a book outward to her class so that they can see the illustrations as she reads. Captain Data Doodle and the mischievous data-munching monster, she begins as the kids giggle and fidget. 
Slowly turning each page as she reads and scans her eyes across the classroom, her animated voice rising and falling, Mrs. Taylor narrates the story of Captain Data Doodle, a heroic dog who teaches kids about the value of data privacy by thwarting the dastardly plans of a rogue gallery of data ne'er-do-wells. In this book's adventure, a data-munching monster terrorizes a small village of squirrels who have failed to properly store and secure their data. These squirrels have no locks on their windows and doors, and their passwords are as easy as one, two, three, four, Mrs. Taylor reads in the booming voice of the data muncher monster. On the wall behind Mrs. Taylor, posters display various elements of the school's kindergarten curriculum. A math poster illustrates 20 sequential clusters of apples, from one apple to 20 apples. A reading poster shows the alphabet, and another poster just underneath it lists combination of letters that form simple three-letter words. One poster lists the do's and don'ts of password protection. Do, use numbers and symbols. Don't, share your passwords with friends. Another poster features Captain Data Doodle holding a padlock shield in one paw and a key sword in the other, a blue hero's cape flapping in the wind, and a speech bubble with Captain Data Doodle's famous catchphrase, keep your paws off my data. Mrs. Taylor closes the book. Now, what do you think those squirrels should have been doing to protect their data? The kids' hands shoot up in the air. Jackson impatiently exclaims, eat more glue. The kids giggle as Mrs. Taylor rolls her eyes. Despite the challenges educators face, we're already seeing that near ubiquitous implementation of cybersecurity and privacy training in education systems is making a positive impact. Students are also more aware of cybersecurity and privacy professions now, and these career paths are seeing a welcome increase in the number and diversity of prospective professionals. What's more, these impacts are starting to extend beyond school walls. As individuals are becoming more aware of the importance of cybersecurity and data privacy, they're beginning to push legislators to improve national policies and regulations. These scenarios represent only potential futures, of course. The best we can do in the present day is use exercises like these to get better at anticipating and planning and to practice creative thinking about our future grounded in the best information we have available to us so that we can be more prepared to face whatever future does eventually arrive.